Alex Maciel and D-Man Gomez both requested a Dromaeosaurid, and Happy Monkeyfish requested Deinonychus specifically, which I found out yesterday is actually pronounced Deinonychus, uh, as if it were a Greek word, which makes sense because it is from the Greek, it means terrible claw. But my whole life I have said Deinonychus, and then yesterday, for the first time, I heard it out loud, and it's Deinonychus, so I will try to pronounce it properly for you. Deinonychus is a very important animal in the history of paleontology because when it was discovered in the mid-1960s, there had been a bit of stagnation in, in the paleontological community, which, you know, two world wars and a Great Depression will do that for scientific output, but people were still publishing work and making discoveries, but it was kind of time for a change, and that change happened in the form of John Ostrom, who you should read more about because he was a paleontologist through and through, which is probably the highest compliment I can give a person. He found Deinonychus in Montana in 1964 and was struck by how active and really bird-like and agile it seemed. It's important to note that for the entire first half of the 20th century, the conception of dinosaurs was exactly that perception that we've been arguing against on this show this whole time. The giant elephantine lizards plodding along, waiting to go extinct when mammals showed up on the scene. And that might have had a role in the lack of public interest in dinosaurs that we have from that time. but. Here comes Ostrom. Ostrom. Uh, Ostrom is another name that I heard for the first time out loud yesterday. I've always said Ostrom, but it's Ostrom. But Ostrom and his student, Bob Bakker, came along, and, and, and it started with Ostrom noticing the marked similarities between Deinonychus and the much, much, much earlier find, which was Archaeopteryx, which is the first bird, and we will totally do an episode about Archaeopteryx and the dinosaur bird connection. If someone will please send me an Archaeopteryx toy. These were not new ideas. The idea of an active theropod, at least, had existed in Charles Knight's time when he painted the famous Leaping Laylaps painting, uh, which interestingly enough looks like the inspiration for a Bakker art that, that is two feathered Deinonychus fighting in much the same poses. But these were not new ideas. The, the idea of, of warm-blooded, to use an antiquated term, dinosaurs was not necessarily new, but it hadn't been considered seriously in a very long time. Not, nor had the, the idea of birds as silurosaurs, neither had the idea of dinosaurs being a natural group. For a very long time, we thought that dinosaurs were Saurischians and Ornithischians, and that dinosaur was just a colloquial term for two separate families. Now we believe that dinosaurs were a natural group, that they were all descended from one common ancestor, possibly one very similar to Aoraptor. Deinonychus is an animal that you might be familiar with it without realizing it. it. It seems to have been the inspiration for what were called velociraptors in Jurassic Park, and we will totally cover velociraptor on this show. I know a million people have requested it. The reason I mention this, velociraptor was known for many years before Deinonychus was ever discovered, but I guess no one really made the connection the way that Ostrom did with Deinonychus. And the reason I say that Jurassic Park was influenced by Deinonychus is because, well, first off, they dug it up in America, and velociraptors are known from Mongolia, and two, the size. The ones in the movie were basically the size of Utahraptor, but that wasn't known at the time. Velociraptor was only, like, the size of an eagle, maybe, whereas Deinonychus was the size of, perhaps, a wolf. Dromaeosaurs, Dromaeosaurids, which is the group that this guy and Velociraptor belong to, varied in size quite a bit, but they were all small to medium sized. You've got Microraptor, which is one of the smallest known dinosaurs, it was about the size of a crow, to Utahraptor, which was the size of a horse. They shared a common ancestor with birds, 
and troodontids. They were the, the troodontids and dromaeosaurs are sometimes grouped together into Deinonychosauria, but we're not entirely sure that that's a natural group. That is, we don't know that they share a common ancestor that is not also a common ancestor of birds. It'll be interesting to see where that goes. Furthermore, Deinonychus has gone back and forth a few times between being really closely related to Velociraptor or being really closely related to Dromaeosaurus. Currently, it's sort of in between. It's definitely a, what's called Eudromaeosaur, but it's not any closer to one than to the other. The important takeaway is very close to birds. So close to birds, in fact, anatomically, that there was a, a sort of fringe theory for a little bit uh, that Velociraptor and Deinonychus and other dromaeosaurs were, were actually true birds that had reverted to flight, flightlessness. That is, they were secondarily ground-dwelling predators, and, and we don't think that anymore, but it is telling that they are so very close to birds. That common ancestor that I mentioned between the dromaeosaurs, the troodontids, and birds would have lived in the Jurassic period, whereas this guy was early Cretaceous. So that's quite a long time to go from whatever the progenitor was to the somewhat more derived traits that we see in the, the true dromaeosaurids. And looking at this toy, you might wonder, well, what would have convinced them that this was an active, warm-blooded creature? Because this looks like kind of an awkward crocodile on two legs, and you would be right in that assessment, but that's because this toy is horrible. I do enjoy that they have made this bipedal creature bipedal, and they have portrayed the hip parallel to the ground, the tail straight out for balance. That is great. They have had to cheat and put one arm on the ground because the tail is entirely too short and the torso is too long and it's really too heavy altogether. Like, it has a lot of belly on it. Based on the length of the femur, which is going, what I'm going to base all of the size comparisons on because nothing else is to scale anyway, it's almost like the creature just fed and it's, it's bloated. There's no reason for it to have that much guts underneath it. They have the highest point on the back be just in front of the hips, which is accurate based on the length of the neural spines. You sometimes see restorations that take that curve even further by bending the spine physically down to go into the, the curve of the neck. I can't say that it's wrong not to do it that way, but it would help to emphasize the, the posture of the creature. I mentioned the hip earlier, the pubis on this guy is reversed. Even though it's a theropod and therefore a Saurischian dinosaur, it actually has what looks like an Ornithischian hip. We saw this with Therizinosaurus as well. It's something that shows up in the Manoraptors, including modern birds. Um, but because the pubis was as long or longer than the femur, you're going to see it sticking out uh, underneath the tail behind the legs there which is not portrayed on this toy. <laughs> Moving into the tail, they've made an effort to show it being pointed straight out. It had reinforcing bony rods, uh, like a lot of dinosaurs. Uh, for Deinonychus, they're pretty famous because the initial restoration that Bacher drew for the, for the study uh, uh, naming the specimen had this really rigidly straight tail out, and they theorized that since it could bend at the base and, and in theory, not uh, along the rest of the length of it, it would be sort of a lever to help it um, balance while, while making sharp turns or running. But articulated skeletons of related genre we found have the tail actually curving quite a bit side to side. So maybe it was more an adaptation to help keep the tail off the ground. We know that based on Microraptor, it would have had a tail fan of feathers, uh, roughly rounded diamond shape, starting about halfway down the tail and, and being widest just before the tip. So maybe the bony rods had something to do with that. It could have been a display structure rather than a, a functional structure. The forelegs are about 
half as long as they should be. They should be a little bit longer than the femurs. But the muscles that are on them and the ones on the thighs are not bad. It's, it's good to see that they have put the muscles on the legs instead of on the feet, like what you often see on dinosaurs. Dinosaur toys, I should say. The feet are actually pretty good. They've put a lot of attention into making sure that the claw is accurate for obvious reasons. The claw is one of the popular features of this, this genus. The, the hypertrophied is what it's called instead of atrophied, which is where it gets smaller. Hypertrophied is where it gets bigger. The, the second toe, the first toe is just a dew claw, and I like that they have put the dew claw in the right place and it's the right size. But the second toe is more hook-like than scythe-like. You would see on Velociraptor, it's, it's a much smoother curve, whereas on Deinonychus, it's a little squarer, and they've got that right. It's maybe a little too big, but I have no problem with the third or fourth toe. They seem right to me. The ratio of femur to foreleg to foot bones implies that this was not a distance runner like the ornithomimosaurs or that would be. This was an ambush predator, so think more panther than deer. For integument, which is a fancy word for body covering, the tenacious feathers probably stopped at about the ankle. One of the references for restoring these guys is actually, appropriately enough, modern raptors. So once you hit the ankle, some restorations show the down continuing down to the foot, and some restorations have the scoots start there. And in all cases, there are scoots on the foot as well. This is contrary to what you see in Pedopenna or Microraptor, where, the, where there are actual flight feathers on the foot. You often see dinosaurs that are only tangentially related to birds restored with very bird-like scoots on their feet. That might not be accurate for them, but for Deinonychus it would be because the scoots on a bird's foot are modified feathers as opposed to being actual, you know, residual scales. Which makes sense for, for such a bird-like creature as this, but doesn't make so much sense for perhaps an ornithopod. All of the compliments I paid the musculature of the hind limbs I have to take back when talking about the forelimbs because those are extremely lizard-like. Also, the one that's reaching up to, to almost touch his chin, I don't think Deinonychus' shoulder permitted that far of motion forward. Their, their shoulders were kind of weird. They seem to have had a lot more range of motion than other Silurosaurs would have had, but still not nearly as much as a flying bird would have. And especially the up-down motion was not that great. But it, it is reasonably accurate that they have the hands facing each other, because like most dinosaurs, it, it really couldn't pronate its hands down to do the, the pose that you see most raptors portrayed in, 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 in movies and art. The hands would default to facing each other until it outstretched its arm, at which point it would what's called supinate, which is where it turns upwards, which we can do whenever we want because our bones work that way, but theirs didn't. That has implications about the forelimb function. Aside from the obvious, which would be grabbing things, there's a theory that juvenile Deinonychus would actually be able to use what's called wing-assisted inclined running, or wear, to run up steep surfaces that they couldn't otherwise run up. It gives us a functional purpose rather than a display purpose for the feathers that were all over the arms. And I should talk about the hands before I get to the feathers. The hands on this guy are horrible. They, they, are, they look like someone sort of grafted inaccurate Allosaurus hands onto it. The, the, the hands on Dromaeosaurus in general and Deinonychus specifically were as long as the forearm. The second finger was the longest. Uh, the second and third finger both had relatively small claws but had feathers running almost parallel to them. 
but the first finger didn't support any feathers at all and had a rather large claw on it. As I mentioned in the Therizinosaurus episode, the wrists on Manoraptors had a, what's called a semi-lunate bone, where they could rotate their wrists relative to their forearm in a way that most other dinosaurs just couldn't do. They still couldn't fold their wings entirely like a bird could, but they could get closer. And finally we come to the head, which is terrible. It, they, they have put a sort of generic dinosaur head on it, which if you know anything about dinosaurs is a meaningless statement because how would you describe a generic dinosaur head? But in a derived Cretaceous Silurosaur, that's kind of unforgivable. For starters, it's too small. The neck is entering the head at the bottom instead of at the back, so give it an S-curved neck. The feathers would do a lot to help smooth the transition from head to neck to body, but you would still see the S-curve. The eyebrow ridges are entirely too wide. The, the widest point on the skull was the hinge of the jaw. The whole skull is too broad. And the eyes should face forward slightly. It, it didn't have the binocular vision of, say, Tyrannosaurus, but it did have some binocular field of view. And the eyes are too far back as well. They have at least shown the jaw muscle proceeding through the back of, ma back of the mouth there instead of sort of a toothy grin going all the way back, which you see sometimes, which just wouldn't work. They wouldn't be able to use their jaw. And they've included a, a sort of throat pouch, which you see a lot in, the, in both carnivorous and herbivorous dinosaur restorations, which makes sense. The feathers on the head are sometimes restored with a sort of crest uh, at the back in the middle. That's based on what we now think is a mistaken conclusion based on fossils of Microraptor. It was thought that the preserved feather traces were showing a crest on top of the head when actually that's just how they were flattened when the animal died. So much more, well, raptor-like with the, with the view of the head, which includes, sometimes you'll see them restored, especially in the early days of when we were hypothesizing about uh, uh, fluffy dinosaurs. They would just cut the feathers off sharply at the back of the, the head. We now figure that that's quite inaccurate. It would be more like a bird's head where only the top of the nose going down towards the, for lack of a better term, lips of the creature would be bare, and then short feathers start, and there's feathers around the eyes, and then finally full panaceous feathers at the back of the head. And just in general, the feathers would help to streamline the creature and give it a much smoother profile, really. And we will talk more about the evidence for feathers next time. But for now, that's all I can say about this Deinonychus. Thank you for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Suggest dinosaurs for me to have on the show. You could send me a toy dinosaur. Our address is in the description. Please go to thegeekgroup.org to find out how you can become a member. You can get involved. You, you can donate. We are open to the public. We are, we are serving the needs of the community for, for science and technology education. And we'll see you next time. This video was made possible by a grant from the Future Girl Foundation. This video was made possible by thousands of private donations from members and viewers like you. Please visit thegeekgroup.org for more information on how you can donate and become a part of our dreams of Avalon. I would rather go back 10 minutes than misinform our audience about corgis. Homeothermy. These are big words, and I'm a simple man. <laughs>